few of you have asked what I think about dough. And because I still don't know a lot about it, this is a great chance for me to show you how I research growth stocks that I'm not familiar with. And I'll think out loud so that you can hear and see how I think about different aspects of the company, just so that I can decide whether I'm going to invest more time into researching this stock. I'm not going to edit this video too much. If you enjoy videos like these, make sure you gently smash a like button or let me know in the comment section below in terms of which company you'd like me to do next. And if you see a company in the comment section that you really like, make sure you upvote it so that I know that will be the next company to create a video on. Before I talk about my preliminary research process, it's important that we congratulate the team over in Doe. Now, firstly, I am not invested in Doe and I don't plan to, but starting a company is really hard. Starting a new bank is like borderline impossible. So the fact that they've gone this far and have raised money and are now public, this is an achievement on its own. So congratulations to the team over there. It doesn't really matter what I think, what anyone else thinks about the competition. The fact is they are public. They have a little bit more than $5 million to spend. So I would love to see what they can do with that money. With my preliminary research process, there's really three main steps. First, I want to have a really good understanding of the business, how it makes money, the market it operates in, and the key risks. Secondly, I want to know who's behind that company pushing the company forward because at the end of the day, people build businesses. And then third, numbers are the last thing I check. It's more of a sanity check at the very end just to see whether there is enough depth for me to keep investing my time to research more into the company. Now, when it comes to understanding the business, my objective is just to understand how it makes money the market it operates in, and also the key risks of the business. And the easiest way to do this is via either investor presentations, uh, CEO talks, those are super helpful, or the IPO prospectus. Now, Doe didn't IPO. They did a reverse takeover in order to go public. So it wouldn't exactly be called IPO prospectus, but I think we'll still be able to find their prospectus if we just type in IPO prospectus. And the easiest way to find the investor presentation or the IPO prospectus is just to search for it. And okay, so that's the investor presentation. And then we'll we also want the IPO prospectus. Well, prospectus, replacement prospectus. Okay, I'm gonna get a copy of this. And then we have their prospectus as well. Okay, great. Now, I always like to start off with investor presentations because it gives me a really good overview very quickly. So give me a second as I skim through the slides just to see which one is the most relevant to understand what exactly did they do and how did they make money. Now, in their overview, they give us a pretty good idea of what it is that they do, but it's pretty confusing. So let's talk about it. They're essentially saying that they're a neobank. At the same time, they're also saying that they're leveraging a wholesale BASN model. And BAS stands for banking as a service, which means that they don't have their own banking license and will be relying on a partner bank to provide the default banking services like checking accounts or taking deposits. What they offer the consumer is very much in the software. So I'm not sure if Neobank is a right word to describe though. It's more of a FinTech software as a service company. In terms of how they make money, we are going to ignore the future ways of monetization because all of these are going to take a while to realize. So I'm going to ignore them for now. And they're saying that they make money either via interchange or deposits. Now, I'm not sure what deposits mean because for banks, they make money on deposits because they take your deposit and then they lend it out. And then of course, then they're essentially making money on those deposits. From what I understand, Doe doesn't have a credit product. So I'm hoping that the prospectors will explain a little bit more in terms of how they're making money via deposits and interchange are just transaction costs. So whenever you buy something from anywhere, the middleman usually take a clip of that. This, this slide is also really worthwhile talking about as well, because essentially what they are telling us is that they're going to spend majority of the money that they raised via paid marketing platforms. Paid marketing essentially means ads. They're going to buy a lot of ads. And it seems like they're buying a lot of Google App Store apps, Facebook, YouTube, and they'll be doing a bunch of other things to essentially get their word out there and acquire new users. 
I have to say, I'm not a big fan of this because with e-commerce platforms, there's something in growth that we call acquisition loops. When you spend money and get new users, they make a transaction in the e-commerce. And usually each transaction, you have a net profit. And that net profit essentially just goes back into the ads. The more money that you make, the more ads you can spend and this loop will spin faster and faster. There are some people who call it growth flywheel as well. It doesn't really matter. The point is, as you spend more money, get new users and then more transactions, it feeds the beast. It just spins faster and faster because you can spend more money and you will keep spending until it doesn't make sense to spend money to acquire new users anymore. The problem with FinTech is that as you spend money, you acquire new users, they take time to get monetized. Now. I'm going to see how they monetize their new users in just a second, but I'm fairly confident that the ways that they're monetizing their new users are gonna take time to recoup the money that they spend on paid ads. And I think they're gonna burn a lot of money in this acquisition loop to get new users. And I think the only reason for doing that is they want to show the public markets that they can acquire new users very efficiently and then justify the next round of capital raising. By doing this, you're essentially committing to a new capital raise because this is, it is more than likely that they're going to burn through that money in less than six months. And if we take a look at all the things that they'll be spending on, Facebook, Instagram, Google, they cost a lot of money, especially influencers and industry affiliates. Now, if they're building a YouTube channel as well, they should probably start now because it takes a long time for the YouTube channel to come to fruition. And it's not something that you can just turn on. And also they mentioned that the key focus will be to launch and scale member get member program. So what that essentially means is that every new user that they get on Doe needs to be able to acquire multiple users. So I'll give you a really good example. For Yoda Bank, which is the company that Graham Stephan actually invested in, and it's incredible by the way, especially in the US, every person that you refer, you will get a raffle ticket to, to go into a draw that you can potentially win $10 million. And they've gamified this whole process to save and then have an opportunity to win even more money. Now, that is almost guaranteed. For every new user they get, they are going to get a lot more other users to go on the platform. That's what you call a viral acquisition campaign. Another good example is Cash App. Cash App have done such a great job when it comes to viral acquisitions. And for every new user that they get, they are encouraging them to retweet, tag people, and this has worked out really well for Cash App. So for Doe, what I'm expecting is that over the next couple of months, we should see their campaigns come online. Now that they have their capital raising, it's likely that they're going to be spending that money to create content and get ready for this campaign. But frankly speaking, I don't know how they're going to differentiate themselves, especially in the US, when there is such a great campaign going with Yoda Bank and also Cash App. And if they can pull off something incredible, it means that their marketing team or the growth team is really freaking good. So now I'm in their perspectives and I want to take a look at how exactly are they making money via deposits. So one of the easiest way to do this is just to search for revenue. Okay, so it seems like in the short term, okay, so they're making money via government rebates, uh, MasterCard incentives. Oh, so this is transaction costs and acquisition of brokered deposit paid to Doe. Okay, so I'm assuming that when they acquire more deposits to their banking partners, their banking partners are going to pay them a commission. And then in the next 12 months, they're saying that they want to look into a monthly subscription fee. I think this is going to take longer than 12 months. They'll need to have an incredible feature that people will pay money for. So I'll be keen, I'll be keen to see what they can do within 12 months for sure. And then for key risks of the business, Fraud risk, competitive risk. Yeah, for sure. Like with any fintech companies, fraud is big. Cybersecurity is big. Uh, regulatory compliance. Those are pretty standard. For me, hiring is incredibly important and execution as well. I think everything else follows on from having great people. Now, the challenge with fintech is that in the US, you're fighting against Yoda Bank, some of the venture back companies. The challenge of the route that they took is that because they went with public markets, they don't have a really strong venture capital company on their back. Because sometimes what happens is that with startups, they hire people using or leveraging the network from their venture capital company that's backing them. 
for example, if you're backed by Sequoia or Axel, you can essentially boast or flex that you're backed by these people and these venture capitalists can also help you headhunt. Because you went with the public route, you don't have that luxury. So you have to depend on the internal team to acquire talent. And sometimes that could be really hard if you don't have amazing names in the management team. And I think for me, everything else be taken care of as long as you take care of the hiring risk. If you, as long as you have great people, a lot of the other things can be dealt with really quickly, especially execution. If you can't hire correctly, everything else become so much harder. So for me, first and foremost, hiring for sure. All about talent. It's the people that makes the company, not the technology. Yes, market does pull a great product out at any time the market wants, but it's the people that wins the market at the end of the day. If I'm interested in this company, hiring 100%, that's where I'm keeping my eyes on. Just going back to the investor presentation, because I'm trying to understand who exactly they're going after. And it seems like they're going after millennials, of course, because millennials are 2.5 times more likely to switch banks compared to baby boomers and Gen X. Fair enough. And it seems like the segment that they're focusing on is Henry's, which is high earners, not rich yet. And they're defining high earners, not rich yet, as people who earn 100K to 250K. I wonder how you can find that with Google ads and Facebook ads. Maybe they're using location specific ads because in the US, depending on which location you're living in, you can almost work out on a probabilistic model that in these geographic locations, it's likely that a concentration of Henry's is right there. So maybe that's what they're doing. But what could you possibly offer the Henry's to try the product and then invite their friends over? You need something that's so good that they cannot refuse. And can they top Yoda Bank? I don't know about that. So I'll be pretty keen to see what that viral campaign will be. The last thing in the investor presentation I wanna go through is this value comparison. Now, out of these companies, the one that I'm most worried about is Revolut. Revolut are a very tightly run ship. If you're interested in that company, listen to the talks between the CEO and some of the interviewers. Don't listen to the TechCrunch interviews, listen to anything else except for the TechCrunch interviews. He talks about how he structured the teams. He talks about how he solved very technical problems. They are structured the way Canva is structured in Australia. So it's startup within a startup. And as you can see, they've done really, really well. And the CEO's thesis when it comes to Revolut is as long as the product is 10 times better than what anyone else can offer, that's how they win. That's how they win customers over. So for Doe, my question is, what are you offering that's 10 times better than anything else that's in the market? Because if you can do that, their probability of winning significantly increases. So I'm really interested in when they launch their viral campaigns. I wanna know what are you offering that could be so much better than the banks and some of the other competitors to win customers over? Because you'll need something very, very good. So we basically went through how the business makes money, the markets it's currently operating in and the key risks of the business. I usually have a checklist whenever I do my research and usually just top of my head and I'll take them off as I go through. I created a checklist for you. So hopefully this will be useful as you start researching growth companies. Now the second step in my research process is the management team. Who is the co-founder? What is his relevant experience in the problem that he's trying to solve? What exactly is the ownership structure of the company? Because all of those factors is going to influence which direction the company is going to go. Now, the first thing I like to do is come to the website and then go to about. I just wanna see who exactly is in the management team and then I wanna learn more about the co-founder. Now, the people that I am most interested in is Andy, Mark and also Micah because well, ultimately this is a software product. So you really hope that the CTO is really good. And then you wanna know who exactly are the co-founders. So let's start with Andy. So what I like to do is I like to stalk them on LinkedIn. And I just wanna go through their profile just to see if there's any relevant experience so on and so forth. And it seems like he's being at it for about four years. Okay, cool. And as a co-founder for Society One. Well, that's great because Society One is probably one of our better stories in Australia. There's not that many great startup stories in Australia and I personally believe that Society One is probably one of them, definitely one of them. There's other ones like Canva, Safety Culture, Airworlix. Those are really, really good. Okay, 
Now the next person we're looking for is Mark. So Mark Taylor, just wanna see his background and if he's the CMO, I'm hoping that, now as I'm going through this, I actually watched an interview between Andy Taylor and Tank Shrimp Labs and it seems like they have a lot of digital marketing experience in the company. So I'm hoping that because of their depth in digital, it should translate into a really good viral campaign. So we'll see how they do with that. And it seems like, you know, Mark is definitely on the digital side as well. So that's good. At least agency people can't BS him. And then let's look at the CTO, which is Micah. So, okay, let's see what Micah's got. Rotor Studios, what's that? Okay, Leap Developments, okay, okay. So this is the thing. When it comes to hiring, either you have a venture capital arm that's behind you, pushing you forward and helping you recruit, or you have incredible, incredible people in the management team that's like X Amazon, X Google, so on and so forth. So then it makes it easier to hire technology talent or even product people, or growth marketing people. It makes it easier. Andy is, in my opinion, the standout, obviously. I think you'll be very, very reliant on him to go hunt for people. Social proof matters, and I hate to say it, because they went through the public capital route, they don't have a strong or very popular VC like Sequoia or anyone else pushing them forward and help them headhunt. They're going to rely very heavily on Andy to make or hire people or, or hunt for people. So we're gonna have to see how he does when it comes to talent acquisition, you know, moving forward. Because at the end of the day, people love social proof. They wanna work at a company that's raise this amount of money backed by these people and also have like, you know, ex McKinsey people, so on and so forth, like big brand names so that they can go flex and brag about it. And all of that, despite you like it or you don't, it really helps with hiring talent. So I'll be really, really interested to see how Andy navigates that, especially in the next six to 12 months. Now coming back on the slides, we just took a look at who the co-founders are and the relevant experience that the co-founder has solving the problem that they're trying to solve. So Andy definitely has that experience, especially from starting Society One. But again, I think they're gonna have a hiring issue. So let's look at the ownership structure just to see who else owns big stakes in them. The easiest way usually is to go to Simply Wall Street and just go to the ownership tab. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like they have that information yet. So we'll have to go back to their prospectus. So this is their prospectus and I'm just gonna search for ownership. So give me a second as I find the ownership structure. So it seems like Andy is still gonna hold majority stakes after the capital raise, owning about 37 or 38% of the company. Well, that's great because this is a founder-led company. Okay, so I found the board members and it seems like Steve is one of them. So Steve worked in ANZ, Institutional Loans. Okay, well, that suddenly will help Patrick. Okay, so these people will be key to helping Doe capital raise in the future. You want connections and you want people to pull strings for you. The, the more people can pull strings for you, the, the higher your valuation. It makes a difference, it really does. So. Regardless, coming back on the slides, I also have a checklist for management team. This is my own personal preference. Feel free to change them. I prefer co-founder led, so yes. Their experience is also relevant to the problem that they're trying to solve, especially Andy's experience in Society One. And even though it is different, but at the end of the day, it's still a fintech company. Now the ownership structure is still mostly co-founder owned, which I'm really, really happy about. Just to reiterate, I do think they're gonna be very reliant on Andy to go hunt for talent because they went the public route. They don't have a very famous VC on their back to help them head hunt. So I'll be very keen to see how he managed or navigates talent acquisition in the next couple of months. Now, the last thing I like to look into are the numbers. Let's go to their perspectives for that. Now, before I talk about the PL, I found this table. They're essentially saying that they're going to spend $2.7 million in marketing. And so that will probably include the ads, the editors for the content that they create, just basically every, everything when it comes to marketing related items. And that's a lot of money. So I'm, I'm just very curious to see how they spend this money. Because if you launch this campaign now, the ads are not 
as expensive. As you head towards end of the year, it gets more expensive because more advertisers are jumping on the platforms, right? But there are more people watching. But in January, the ads are cheaper, but not as many people are watching because most people are on holidays. So I'm just very keen to see how they spend this money. Now, when it comes to their PL, this is really interesting to me because they're saying that they generated $940,000 in the 2018 financial year and a little bit less for the 2019 financial year. And for the six month ended 31st of December, 2019, they've generated $598,000. Now, I can't seem to find where that money is coming from. How are they generating that money? Is this via partnerships? Is this via their existing customers? Do they currently have existing customers? If any of you have better insights in terms of how they're generating that money, I would love to know. So please let me know in the comment section below because I cannot find how they're generating that revenue. Post capital raise, they should have approximately 7 million in cash, 7.8 million in current assets. So more than enough current assets to cover its current liabilities, a lot more. So they should have no problem, at least in the short term, to manage any external shocks. But I think the marketing spend is gonna burn through that money really quickly. So we'll see how things go. Now, coming back to the slides, I have a checklist for numbers as well. Usually I like to see some kind of revenue growth and you expect that revenue growth to be quite drastically increasing, but because I am unsure of how they're generating that revenue, I can't give them that tick. When it comes to current ratios, they have more than enough current assets to manage all of their current liabilities. So they should have no problem managing any external shocks and plenty of cash to meet their liabilities as well. So that's not a problem. I'm just curious how they are making money right now. Now, with most companies, especially growth companies, there's no point trying to assess what their fair value is because it's purely based on future sentiment. The more important question you need to ask yourself is, given what I know about the business so far, what do I think the company can become in the next couple of years? You ultimately need to be the one that feel comfortable with that decision-making. And for me personally, I just think that Doe is too early on in the journey I will keep my eyes on this company, but I do think it's too early for me to invest more time researching this company. I would like to see this company become more mature before I take a, a second or a third look. It's just too early on. Now, if you learn something new, make sure you gently smash that like button right there, subscribe to my channel and click onto the bell so that when I release future videos, you'll be the first one to know. Until next time, my name is David and I'm gonna see you very, very soon.